right, here we are, another episode of Let There Be Talk, and uh, a great guest today. I know if you listened to my show last week, I got into uh, talking about Lenny Kravitz, which, you know, drove me down the rabbit hole of my memory and reminded me of a long lost friend who was the king of the leather. And uh, he is here to get today. I fucking found him. The power of the internet. Introduce yourself, my man. What's up, Dean? It's Jordan here. What's up, bro? Good to see you. <laughs> Dude, I haven't seen you. How long has it been since I've seen you? Oh, man. <laughs> 10 years? Yeah, and 10? No longer. I've been doing comedy. For, I've been doing yeah, comedy. I mean, for I mean, I've been in Miami now for six years, and, and you haven't. I haven't seen you here. So New York days, man. We're going way back in time, bro. Way back in time. From, the, from the lost art years, man. The lost art years, man. That's right. 20 years. 20 years I did that in New York, you know? 20 years. Yeah. Man, I don't really remember how we met, but I do know it was around between 02 and 06 when I was working for the Stones. I know that. Yeah, around that time is probably when you started you started collecting, bro. You had an amazing lost art collection. Oh, my God. I did. I sold it all because I lost weight. <laughs> it didn't fit anymore. And now I need it, man. Too let's, late, bro. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. So you did uh, custom leathers for 20 years in New York City. And it was in the, the frame of, say, North Beach Leathers, East West Musical Company, that kind of stuff. How did you get started? And uh, what was your your obvious influences were those? But how did that all happen? Were you a rock and roller and you're looking for leather? No, it's actually really funny, man. All those those incredible companies that you just mentioned, I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about them when I started doing my leather work. I never heard of of that whole West Coast handmade leather scene that wasn't at all what i was uh i, I was never introduced to that i started making you know i grew up more in the woods around horses a lot of like leather saddles harnesses you know the the tack wear for horses leather boots leather jackets but not that traditional handmade thing that you're that you're referencing you know once i i made my i started my leather work by making stuff for myself. I made myself a bag. That was my first thing I ever made. I was like, I need a leather bag. I'm going to make it. After I did that and I got the, the, you know, the ball started to roll a little bit. The words started getting out there. That's when I got introduced to Anna Sui, who's like quite an established designer in the fashion world. And she's the one who actually started showing me from her own personal archive of, of stuff these incredible like like handmade pants from like North Beach leather, uh, you know, all those the guys that you just talked about. That was my first introduction to even seeing their work. And I remember like so clearly the first day she pulled out this pair of uh, like North Beach leather pants from like genuinely real North Beach pants. They were like, you know, in her archive from the from the 70s. And it blew my mind, man. I was like, I was like, this is just a whole other, a, a whole other universe that just has been like thrown into my, into my, that just became open to my mind, you know? And then, you know, over the 20 years, we did everything from jackets to pants, to guitars, to, to motorcycles. But it was really in my early beginning of already doing leather is when I started learning about those guys who'd been doing it years, you know, 20 years before me. What year are we talking about? When I started Lost Art was 1997. That was the, when I first made my first leather bag. You're going back to the time of like the late 60s, the 70s, when these guys were doing like a lot of handmade stuff out West. And also, um, I think some stuff was coming up from Mexico where these guys were doing a lot of hand traditional work, you know. But then more what I was influenced by was going way back to like the American Indians, man. They're the ones who, who for me, 
were the, the first ones who started really doing this incredible works of art with leather and hands and combining different materials like feathers, crystals, stone, you know, like fringe. All this goes back to the American Indians. They could take credit for it, man. No one that's come after them could really credit, take credit for like fringe, you know? Right. They were first. I, you know, we're talking about if people are uh, wondering what type of style we're talking about, if you really look in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, people like Keith Richards, Creedence Clearwater, and also if you watch the movie Almost Famous, uh, they're using, um, they're using uh, North Beach leather in there. And it's the leather pants that like you would see G&R wearing, where it laced up in the front. And then it had whip stitch kind of down the side. Very, very cool and uh, an obvious um, nod to who it was. You would know right away, oh, that's North Beach, you know? Yeah, their signature, man. Yeah. And then there was that guy in the 90s in Hollywood that had the black hair. And, you know, what was his name? He, he dressed like a rock star in, in the 2000s. Henry Duarte. There it is. Bam. Duarte. I ran into him a couple of years ago at some art show and yep. he's downtown still. But there was guys like you, Duarte, and uh, the guy that's still doing North Beach now. He's out in Joshua Tree. All these guys, you know, that were making cool shit. But to me, your stuff was uh, another level. You didn't use any machines. It was all done by whip stitch and put together. There was no sewing to uh, involved, right? No, completely. I mean, for the most part, the, the we worked entirely by hand. Yeah, that that yeah. did separate us to some degree because most people did hybrids of like some machine work and then with some hand work. We were strictly hand work because for me, it was more about creating a, an original piece of artwork like that for me, each thing we did was was a piece of art. And so I never really thought about the like, oh, we need to make more quicker, which is where you get into machine work. You know, for me, it was artwork. Now, when I stumble on to you, I'm still not quite sure. But I remember I told Jacob Dylan about it. We go, oh, my God, we got we got to get yeah. a couple, couple of these jackets. You a few people. Yeah, man. Yeah. So I remember coming to this loft in New York. I don't remember what neighborhood, but it was incredible where you lived and made this uh, these jackets and pants and everything. Where was that? I was in che West Chelsea, 29th Street, between 10th and 11th Avenue. Yeah, an incredible space, bro. Oh, my God. Now, how did you find that? And what was the price of that place? Because it had to be free <laughs> back then, right? <laughs> Man, that was back in the day in New York City when you could still find that type of stuff, man. Like, uh, like th that building doesn't even exist anymore, bro. Like, the whole building's been demolished. And that was, like, one of the most incredible loft spaces in New York. As far like, you know, like, it was insane. Those places <laughs> don't exist, man. It was back in the day. You could find stuff like that. No one wanted to live over in the West, West Chelsea. A bunch of, like, crackheads and hookers and, you know, transvestites and stuff. Now... It's a completely different world. No one could even imagine what it was before before then, man, you know? Your loft is exactly like a dream I always had. It, it was like something you see in a movie, you go, we're going down to see Jordan. And then you go up this fucking freight elevator and it opens it up and it's your goddamn house. You got fucking couches, you got leather being made, maybe a fucking motorcycle in the corner, that kind of, that kind of thing is just like you said it doesn't exist anymore but it was just such a fucking vibe soon as it opened up and i really remember i was in uh london with the stones and it was fashion week in new york and you had a giant party and i flew in for it i'll never forget it i i split from london to go to your fashion week party and it was like straight up an andy warhol movie man every rock and roll and New York Freak was there, and we were all celebrating our fucking freakness, you know? Yeah, man, that's awesome, man. I love to hear that when, when like, I get memory flashes when people talk to me about stuff like that, you know? That's an awesome story. It, it was. It was a very special time, man. It was a very special time in the history of my life and in the period of, of New York City, you know? There were more freaks back then. There were more creative people. There were more people, you know, like yourself, willing to to get their hands into the creative 
creative people. You know, times have changed, man. And and uh, New York, New York, that that vibe does it doesn't exist anymore, man. It's been priced out. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's get into a little bit of your story. So you make yourself a bag. Right. I, I was talking to people about I go, oh, man, he had these fucking killer bags. And, you know, when you live in New York, you need a man bag. I don't care if you're insecure, like, look at this guy with a man bag, whatever. It fucking rains there all the time. You need, you know, your computer, or your notebooks like me with jokes, any kind of thing. Now yeah. it's overpriced fucking, you know, uh, Louis Vuitton shoulder bags that are made fucking in a sweatshop or whatever, and people pay fucking eight grand for them. But back then, you had a bag. Are you walking around New York and somebody sees you and goes, can you make me a bag? How does it start to fucking snowball? I made the first bag for myself. Back then, I, I made, I was doing a bit of modeling in the fashion industry. So uh, back then, before there were like iPads, people walked around with like a proper portfolio of your pictures and shit, you know? So I needed a bag for my portfolio. That was the, the, the design of why I made my first bag in that rectangular shape with that thick strap, because it's like all I really wanted was something to carry my, pop, my, my, my shit in, my portfolio, a couple of my things, and have like a nice comfortable strap that's not like cutting into my, to, to me, you know? After I made that, a couple of my buddies who were also in the industry asked me to make them a bag. It just started out uh, and I kept making bags. And then this one model girl, her name was Michelle Hicks, quite a well-known model during that time, got one of my bags and showed it to Anna Sui. Anna Sui then asked to like meet with me. And it was through the next few years where she would commission me to do pieces for her collections every season. And she... she had the the vision to keep asking me to do different stuff that I never had done before. So she was like, like, I'm going to each season was a new challenge for me. So she, you know, pants one season, then the next season, like three or four jackets. And then like a guitar case for that, uh, the, the guy from the Smashing Pumpkins would, would carry, you know, like she connected me with a lot of cool people and she challenged me and pushed me creatively. And because it was all being done as lost art for Anasui. It was getting quite a bit of press generation, like a lot of press. A lot of, you know, people were like, who's making this stuff? Because it was so much more unique or different than what they were used to seeing. So it just started snowballing. And then once the press and the editors and the stylists started getting like more known to, to what we were doing, it just really took off, man. It took off. At that time, there was like, I don't know if the industry's maybe it's the same now because I'm not doing it anymore. So I don't have much to compare it to. But at that time, there was something very like uh, fresh about the whole industry, like, you know, Vanity Fair and like rolling stone and like working with these like celebrities and these photographers it, it was a small world that was much more um i don't know there's something exciting about it back then you know well it definitely felt like uh, a big contributor to that exciting moment would be the strokes the yeah yeah yeahs and the new york rock scene was starting to fucking explode that hadn't happened since the seventies of talking heads and Lou Reed and all that. So that yeah. was a giant contributor to this vibe. Although they didn't really wear leather pants, you know, people like Julian were wearing leather jackets again and New York fashion, you know, was looking at leather and rock and roll again. Yeah. There was a, an emergence for sure, man. Now was she your, uh, contact your insight for all these big rock stars because i'm gonna run down some clientele we got lenny kravitz we got willie nelson we got cheryl crow we got axel rose who else was in there dean del rey yeah dean del rey <laughs> it, it's funny because i wore that jacket around the world which by the way we had you on the east coast but on the west coast at the time, we had a shop called Lords, L-O-R-D-S. Yep. And those guys were also killing it with snakeskin jackets and the whip stitch pants also. So there was definitely a couple people flying the flag 
of high quality handmade goods. So was she your insight into the rock and roll? No, not. I mean, to some, she, she was incredible for giving me like that introduction, but it was more into the um her, into the fashion world was with Anna. The rock and roll thing came from working with individual stylists who, who were like, OK, we just saw your stuff in Vogue or in some magazine. We want to like introduce it to who, who we're working with. Could be anybody. Lenny, Lenny came first. Wow. And and, and he came hard. <laughs> yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. But uh, but Lenny came through his his wife at the time when he was married to Lisa Bonet, you know, maybe they were already divorced, but she had done a photo shoot for W Magazine and they had her wearing a pair of my pants in that photo shoot. And she then inquired, you know, through the stylist or through the magazine, hey, who made the this stuff, I think Lenny would love it. So she contacted me and ordered a snakeskin bag for Lenny for his birthday. So she's the Lil Lilacoy, you know, is her name now, Lilacoy Moon. She's really the the one who who introduced the whole world to me because once Lenny got that first bag, it was like game over, man. He became he to this day he owns the most of of anything we've made. And he became like just a diehard, amazing, like uh, inspiring person that I got I got to become great friends with and travel with and just got it was just amazing. Lenny through the Len working with Lenny for the over the 20 years also opened up other doors to plenty of other musicians and rock stars, people in the entertainment industry. Because everyone would see him wearing his stuff, you know? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, you know. He Lynn, wore a lot of stuff, man, for a long time. Oh, he was Lost Art, man. Yeah. Everything. So he had the jackets, the pants. But he also had what I would say is the most famous belt buckle style from the 70s and 60s was that big brass one like, uh, you know, Robert Plant wore. And guys wore that big brass round belt buckle. And you brought yeah. that back, which was fantastic too. Well, I, I love like rings, circle, you know, like heavy brass rings, heavy steel rings. I love that stuff. And and yeah, for me, that's a the lost art traditional belt is the the two circle clasp, two two ring clasp belt. I love it, man. I love it. Morrison was the first guy I ever saw with the double ring, where you just put the. You know, when I saw him wear that, I I hunted one for years in the Hate Ashbury. Found one one day, wore the fuck out of that thing for years, man. Yeah, man, that's the shit. Uh, that is the shit. I still wear one to this day, bro. That's the only belt I wear is my double ring belt, man. God, I love it. Now, when Lenny first comes in, does he come down? Are you at the loft at that time, or are you still are you somewhere else at that time? I had my my first. Studio was in the meatpacking district on Little West 12th Street. It was in like a, a friend of mine had a, a big loft, like same type of deal, like a commercial space that he had made into like a, a hidden living situation. And and he he w when I started working leather, he got interested in it, too. And he was like, you know, you can set up your studio here and work here and make stuff. He would make stuff as well. I don't remember if I met Lenny during those years. I was like, I think I was there for two years in that studio. And then I, then we moved up to the 29th street studio, which is the one that you're talking about, which is that the big loft, you know? Right. Um, but Lenny used to come around that one and hang out regularly, man. He'd come by. I mean, that was the beauty of that place. It was like people would come by just to hang out. And it was such a large space that they could be doing their thing. We could be doing our thing. It wasn't like it was more just like a, a nice place to just spend time without, you know, people could come there and kind of relax. They didn't they, they, they get out of that. Like, uh, you know, they're on the West Side. Let's go over to Lost Art and hang out and just like smoke a J or something, you know? At the same time, there was another guy in New York, Stewart, with Lost Worlds, and he was doing the motorcycle replicas of like old Buco and stuff like that. He's still out there, Lost World. I don't think I know that guy. Yeah, he makes like really thick horsehide motorcycle jackets, identical, like, but even better than the original replicas of like Buco deep pocket motorcycle jackets. See a German dude? Uh, nope, nope, nope. He's, he's over there in, uh, 
Anyway, since I moved to Miami, bro, I haven't really kept up with the leather world at all because it's too hot down here for leather. <laughs> now, let, let me ask you this. So Lenny starts coming around, and then other rock stars are coming around. And are they coming down to the loft and getting fitted or going over stuff with you? Like, how, how did that work? So, yeah, I mean, for the most part, people would come into the studio. They'd go through, you know, the racks of clothes and the stuff that we had hanging there. We would come up with, like, an original idea for what they wanted to have made. I would tape measure them. We would then make all the patterns for them for whatever they're having made up. And we would make it, you know. That's, that's when the person came to the studio. A lot of people that were like coming through town because they're on tour, they didn't have the time to come to the studio. So maybe I'd have to go to their hotel room, spend an hour with them in their hotel room, taking some measurements and just doing the same thing. But there or on a tour bus or on like uh, whatever, man, wherever they were, if they needed me, that's where I, I'd go backstage in between shit, in between interviews, you know, whatever. Okay. But for the 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 best experience for them and for me was when they come to the studio and we would get to like, you know, play guitars, hang out, you know, they could see the leather, the, the real way. So a lot of cool people came through during the, I was in that space for 10 years, the wow. big loft for 10 years. After that, I moved to another loft, but it was a little bit, quite a bit smaller. But during the 10 year period of that in the big place, so many cool, fun, interesting, like creative people came through and it just added to the whole energy of it. You know, the whole the whole vibe of that place was amazing. I mean, I remember you brought Jacob through a couple of times. I don't know. If, I mean, I remember him coming through a few times like it was just like that. One person would get something made. And then, you know, a month later, they'd be like, hey, I, I, my friend saw it. They, they, I want to come by and show my friend your place and come in and they want to get something made someone else from a different a, the band or a different band you know word of mouth man you got any great memories like what about axel he got some stuff right yeah tons of stuff man you he, you remember yeah. any stories on him oh my gosh <laughs> he, he started wearing my stuff before we met because it was again it was done through a stylist who who we worked with who was working with axel she started getting him stuff then it turned out that um i gotta go back in my mind man there was also a girl that i used to date who after we broke up started dating like one of the guys in the band maybe like john frusciante i don't remember who it was but it was like one of the guys it wasn't axel but he started seeing her wearing her leather pants because, you know, she, and anyway, one day he he was in town and and I get a call and it's like, yeah, you know, Axel wants to come to the studio and he rolls in with a few people late. Like a lot of our stuff happened like in the a.m. hours, like 2 a.m., 3 a.m. People would roll in after their show or they'd be out for the night and the club would shut and they'd be like, oh, let's go over to Lost Art. <laughs> you know, let's go wake up Jordan and like hang out there. But he was late one night and I he was in my I had a little private room, which was like where I had my bed and stuff. And he was in there looking. It, I had these like jewelry, these necklaces from like when I would travel to like uh Brazil or the Amazon or India or wherever I collect like these really cool, amazing beads and all kinds of cool stuff that I'd put on a lot of the clothes, but I'd also have my own private collection in my room. And he reached out to like touch this necklace that I'd brought back from the Amazon. And as soon as he touched it, the necklace like exploded. What? <laughs> it was like, and the beads like went, all fell on the floor and like some of them like, like broke and it, like he felt terrible, but it was like the craziest thing because we're both like it didn't. He hardly even touched it, man. It was just like some kind of weird energy thing. Like that moment, it just like explodes. So I, that's my memory of Axel hanging out in my place. I'm like, don't touch anything, bro. <laughs> I remember when I was there one time, you were covering Lenny Kravitz flying V and Gator. Yeah, we did it. A, 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 we worked with Gibson, sent us the stock wood flying v we covered it all up in alligator and leather and then send it back well then send it to lenny's guitar tech who then like set it all up with the electronics and yeah man it sounded amazing he played it I think awesome it so good now let me ask you at at what point you start fucking exploding and you have to have some employees right how many employees did you have at one point the biggest couple 
three, yeah. just like two, two people on the table with me. And then I had like an assistant who just did most of my computer shit, you know? Right. And when it starts to take off, where are you sourcing the leather and the snake and stuff? Are you going to the garment district? Where are you finding? Because your leather was incredible. It was kind of a gooey, real pliable feel, but real durable. Yeah. I would source most of my stuff in, in different places in New York. But then like the real original materials, like some of the snake skins and some of the like crystals and the fur, you know, like that would come from all over the world, bro. All over the world. I still have a lost art snakeskin like bracelet with the buffalo coin or whatever. Oh, right. That was my friend Lonnie started making those. The the wife of Kirk Hammett from Metallica. So oh, yeah. I started working a lot with, with those guys. And Lonnie is super creative. And she started getting inspired. And so she started making like a line of wristbands. And I think that's the ones that you're talking about. Yeah, but yeah, I yeah. got one. Kirk Hammett was always such a fucking king when it came to fashion out of those guys in the band. He really, I relate to him on another level in the fashion world. When we talk, we're talking mostly clothing, eyewear, stuff like that. That's what we talk about more than metal or guitars, you know? Sure. And he was a big lost arts person also. Yeah, man, Kirk's amazing. Like amazing supporter, both him and his wife, Lonnie, those guys, amazing. And I, I like some of my best memories were going to, to see the, their shows, like to a Metallica show is like no other concert. You know, I've seen a few different concerts in my time. There's nothing like a Metallica show. And I've seen a bunch and they're all incredible, man. What a good time. Yeah. Really good time. Like, I, st I still have your book over here, man. The coffee table kind of book with all the designs in it. Yeah. I still got that. It's fucking like one of my crown jewels. It's on my table. People see it. They, <laughs> they're like, what is this? I'm like, a long time ago, my friend. <laughs> It's an antique by now, bro. That's a vintage book. It's fucking cool, though. Now, let uh, me ask you, where does it start to go south? Because you did it for 20 years, and now we're going to get into your next phase of your life. But what happens? Where do, do people stop wearing leather, or does it cost too much to live in New York, or, or everything? What happens? Yeah, I think a little bit of everything what you just said happened at once. And after doing something that was so labor-intensive, for 20 years, just my whole team and myself, we were just tired, bro. You start getting pains in your hands, in your elbows, your forearms from like 20 years of doing the same type of repetition. We were just tired. I, I, I had the opportunity to work with most of the like iconic people who I had like a lot of respect for and and it hoped that someday I'd be able to to do something for. I got to check that box for almost everybody. We expanded into like we did some really cool art and design projects like the wings for the Victoria's Secret fashion shows, some motorcycles, just like more like very interesting stuff. And afterwards I'm just like there's really nothing like I don't know what I want to do next. I've already done that. You know, New York was going through some changes. I wasn't really, I, I wasn't really so, didn't think the changes were positive. I preferred the, the, the old ways because I'm kind of that way in everything, you know. It was just a time to be like, you know what? This has been a, an amazing time in my life. 20 years has been like checked. I wrote the book. Now I could just like uh, chill a little bit, go try to do something else. It, the grind of doing it every day, constantly the work, so much work, man. So many hours of work. It just made me tired at the end. I needed I needed to step away and be like, hey, that was good, but let's move on. And the, the women I had working with me had been with me for years and years and years. So it was like part of my family and they were tired. And I, just the, the idea of thinking of finding new people and starting starting to train them and trying to like, you know, get it. Uh, uh, it was just like, forget it, man. Better to like have the good memory and then to try to like keep it going. Well, what I always uh, find when I interview uh, artisans on the show, and it always seems to happen like this, the artist is such an artist that when the business side comes into it, it becomes taxing and most of them don't want to fuck with it and the whole thing just drops to the you know to the ground it ends because they're like you know what fuck all this man you know and that's oh, the truth that's the truth man to some degree that happened with me i mean obviously in the early years i'm i'm at the table 
10 hours a day doing everything hands on. As the years go by, you tend to be doing less and you, you're watching the other people who are working with you doing the work and you're doing more like bullshit stuff, man. Talking to people, dealing with fucking shit, making sure that there's enough leather for the next like, like, you know, like you're kind of living in the future. You're not living in the moment. You got to always be thinking like, okay, how do, what's next? How do I make sure that I'm staying ahead of everything that I got to stay ahead of? And it just kind of after doing it for 20 years of any business, anything, man, I don't care what it is, just takes a toll and you get a little burned out. That's it. Yeah, I understand it. I understand it. So when you reach that toll, do you just say, that's it? You close and you move or do you say we're done and you're sitting around for a while figuring out what you want to do in life? No, man. I just said, fuck it. I'm moving to Miami fast. Wow. And, and what, I, what made you like, choose Miami? I had a couple of buddies of mine from New York who had moved down to Miami like maybe like two, two years prior to that. They loved it, man. They were like, this place is it's on the upswing, whereas like like cities kind of in my in my mind, you could feel a city that's having a good moment, which Miami is right now and has been for the last couple of years. So it's nice that like, I came down here to check it out. And I was like, fuck, man, this is this is pretty nice, man. I can't do leather here because it's too hot. You know, a few years before I finished doing Lost Art, I was also doing a lot of painting. I figured I could just continue with my painting while I'm here and get that going. And then uh, I did that, you know, and I, that's what I'm doing. I'm a painter in Miami. And I also have been, you know, working on some choppers. That's amazing, man. Before we get into the choppers, one last question on the leather era. Do big stars ever call you anymore like La Lenny and go, hey, man, can you make me something? Well, I still run into Lenny, you know, here and there, and especially in Miami. So he knows that I'm not making anything anymore. You know, at that time when I left New York, I was um, married. I don't know if you met my wife's son at that time. I don't know. We might have. Yeah. I did. You did, right? Okay, yep. so Sun worked with me with Lost Art for like quite a number of years while we were a, a couple. And then when I decided to move to Miami, she continued doing it. So like, as far as I know, she's still making stuff for, for any of the clients that still want stuff to be made. It's definitely not like, she's not promoting it like I used to, you know? Like I was much more of like, you know, I want to get my brand out there. She's just like, you know, if people want stuff done and they're still returning clients who are always asking for more stuff, that's what she's doing. That's why the website's still up, thelostart.com. Oh, wow. Wow. I had no idea. I was wondering because the website was still up and I was like, oh, shit, here he is right here. And then I emailed and I guess she's the one that gave me your phone number. Okay. Yeah. Wild. So she's yeah, still man. making stuff, huh? She is. Yeah. And she makes incredible stuff, bro. Like she has a bit of her own style, but it's it's like amazing, well-made. She's super talented. So yeah, if you want something, get in touch with her. Wow. And is she doing the style of jackets like you used to do? Handmade. Wow. All by hand, bro. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, she, she's got the skills. She knows how to do it all, man. I'll stop in there when I'm in next uh, New York next month. Right on. No, she's in Miami, bro. Oh, she's in Miami. Yeah, she moved down here too, like a little, uh, and um, but we're not together anymore, but she's she's doing the leather work that she needs to do down here in Miami. Wow, that's wild. Yeah. So, so you're painting and then you get the uh, chopper bug and you decide you've never built a chopper. You don't know electrical or, or fabrication or welding or anything. I've rode choppers all my life. And it's very yeah. cool to see that you have taken on another thing. A lot like myself, I started comedy at 44. I never did it. I'm going to do comedy. You're the same way. You're like, you know what? I'm going to build fucking choppers. I don't know how to do it. But I watched a lot of your YouTube videos. And it's a lot like comedy. You found a teacher. You recommend people find a teacher. And yeah. uh, you become an apprentice, uh, quote unquote. That's what I was doing in comedy, sitting in the back room of the comedy store, watching the fucking masters uh, craft their one hour sets. And you are doing kind of the same thing. And now you're building choppers, roster choppers. How long has that been going on? And when did you start? This one behind me is the first one that I did about a year and a half ago. Yeah, a year so and a half cool. ago, I started the first one. Yeah, for me, man, because I didn't like I, I, I was creative, 
but I didn't have the skills that you need to build a chopper. You got to be really, really fucking skilled, bro, in like welding and electrical, all the things you just you just said. You got to be at a very high level. So well, I didn't have those skills, but I found a, a teacher who was this amazing guy from Cuba who just like is a complete genius. I mean, he only speaks Spanish. I, I only speak a little bit of Spanish. Most of our, our communication is just him pointing and like me learning as, as I go. But being around him and watching what he's capable of doing was just like one of the most mind blowing experiences of my life, man. When you're around that stuff and like me, I get inspired by handwork, by craftsmen. Like that's my, my whole thing, you know. So it's not it, it's a completely different type of craftsmanship than working with leather in the the big picture. It's all like the same. Man. And I find it really inspiring to be in that environment. So for me, just being in the garage, smelling the gas, smelling the, the oil, like seeing the welding, the sparks flying everywhere. It's fucking awesome. Well, the chopper is a lot like the leather world where there's been so many styles over the years and choppers and leather go hand in hand. Uh, hand in hand, bro. Starting back with the outlaw motorcycle clubs and the wild one, Marlon Brando, and of course the holy grail, easy rider. But I grew up around choppers and I know. choppers have gone through so many phases and a lot of people don't understand when you're building a chopper, there's two choppers. There's the unrideable and there's the rideable. And the unrideables were happening with the o Orange County chopper type of people with the 300 rear tire and the right. fucking goofy fucking shit welded on it like a fucking Spider-Man face and stuff. But the real rideable choppers like the San Francisco motorcycle clubs were doing with the mid controls up a little bit so you can just haul ass, but the cool fucking look, that's the ultimate chopper. Stuff like uh, Jesse James was building, Roland Sands was building, um, all of these guys out on the West Coast that were killing it. And a lot of people don't even know uh, that a, a couple of brothers built the Easy Rider choppers, which is amazing to think back in that era of motorcycles when it was uh you know primarily a uh, a white culture say and these two brothers built the coolest choppers ever and there's yep. amazing history if you've seen the history of the chopper that jesse james put out that tv show it's fucking mind boggling. Yeah. Yeah. No, man. It's a whole world. It's an incredible, it's an incredible world of artists, man. That's kind of been overlooked, I think, because they're working in maybe functioning art rather than just like an art thing that, that doesn't have any function. To, to make a chopper, you're an, you, you're, you have to definitely have the spirit and the soul of an artist. You know, it's been an incredible experience. So I did, this is my first one. I'll show you. Yeah. Love it. Sports yeah. promoter. You yeah. got the uh, king and queen seat. Yep. You got the fucking Springer front end. Awesome yep. looking. Yeah. All the stuff you said, man. So, you know, you start with the sports there, like you, in a, a stock sports there. You, you cut the frame, you weld on the hard towel right here, and then you rebuild it back up with like uh, either some of the same parts, but mostly parts that you either have to buy or make, you know? Right. A key thing on the choppers, too, what people really need to learn, which is vital, the first thing is the frame with the rake. If you get the wrong rake and shit, the bike's not going to handle right. It's going to be yeah. too fucking weird. So welding and geometry is a huge thing in choppers. It's like BMX bikes. And these people, they're artists. But they fucking figure it out because they, they go and do R&D on these fuckers. They ride them 100 miles an hour on a highway. It's insane, bro. It's really insane. For me, you know, I've never been a daredevil. I've never been like an adrenaline junkie. I'm not even into riding on the highway at 100 miles an hour you know what i like is the process of building them and then looking at them and taking it for a nice like cruise around the neighborhood that's good for me man you know but it's really just like a piece of art it's like a sculpture i'd rather look at that than some sculpture of some piece of metal that doesn't really make any sense that makes more sense to me you know after that one i was addicted to it. And so I started a second one right away. That one got finished. So I've got two under my belt, man. I'm ready to start the third one. And did you sell the second one? No, I got it here. I don't want to sell it. I'm not looking to sell my bikes, you know? 
Um, right. If someone wanted to make one, that would be the best thing. I would, I would like, just like Lost Art, they wanted to have a custom jacket made or a custom pair of pants, whatever. I would make them their custom chopper, talk about how they want it to look. We discuss the seat, the rake, the, the trail, all those things that you were just talking about. And then I'd make up the bike, you know, but I haven't had the opportunity to do that yet for someone, but uh, I'm still new to the game, you know? Here's so what I have been doing though is these videos and I just been putting my videos on my, my YouTube channel, which, you know, Rasta Choppers is the YouTube channel. And that for me is just like a cool way to get the word out there and, and to show, show the bikes and uh, seeing that people are getting like interested and inspired to build their own chopper. So if I could kind of push them on their way and help them a little bit and get them to the point where they're building building their own bike just like I did then that's badass for me that's like cool one person builds a chopper that that from watching my video then I'm like I just I accomplished my goal now my question for you is did you make the seat the leather seat I didn't <laughs> <laughs> but I added I did add some leather to it I don't know if you noticed man I put uh I added like a little a little braid with some feather you know oh yeah there's right. some there's some Jordan flavor right there. But it's not at all a representation of of what I do, bro. But you know what? Making a seat is a a whole new a whole new thing. I will it one day maybe make a seat, but I got to like uh I'll tell you, I got to get what? The greatest seat the greatest seat maker. There's two of them. They you know Paul Cox who does the yeah. handmade whip stitch. Paul Cox being one of the greatest chopper builders I've ever met and a pure artist. And then Definitely. also we had, uh, what's his name? Uh, out there in Malibu. Fuck, he, he makes jackets and motorcycle seats and everything. Shit, what is his name? I can't even fucking remember right now. And I know the guy. He lives in Cabo part-time. But he makes motorcycle seats also. And he did a lot of stuff for Jesse. When I did Lost Art, I had a guy who asked me to cover. I don't know, remember I covered his entire chopper in snakeskin. You did? Yeah, we covered the tank, the fender and snakeskin, and then the headlight and the grips and the seat I did in leather. So I've done the outside of a bike before. I should be getting into doing my seat, you know, but it's just so much work. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, but I'll send you pictures, bro, of the, the, the bike, the chopper that I did, man. We, 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 put, we stitched Lost Art into the seat with like big, heavy stitching. Super bad at welded all around the tank and covered in snake skin. Yeah, you could go crazy on a chopper, man. Like that's why they're so cool because you could just like there's a lot, a lot of creativity that you could work into them. Have you had an opportunity to talk to Lenny about choppers? Because he's a motorcycle. No, I haven't talked to him in quite a while. Not since I've been building the bike. Right. Let's get this straight before uh, we go any further. Now, when his crotch blew out on his leather pants and his dick flew out, that wasn't your no. opinion, right? <laughs> They were not lost art leather pants, man. That's why they failed. Leather pants don't rip, bro. Yeah, yeah. Oh, shit. <laughs> you're right. You're right. Man. Well, I'll tell you what, man. It's so great to touch base with you again. There's people in my life that have really, um, you know, been amazing and a big part of me, you know, like me, I wear clothing and people go, wow, look at that fucking jacket. And, you know, you were at a period of my time when I was working with the Stones, I was just wearing the best fucking shit. And I absolutely loved your jacket. I did a I did a 10 month tour on stage wearing your jacket, that black I one. I remember, bro. I remember seeing the video clips, man. Yeah. And I remember your motorcycle that you showed me pictures of when we first met. You were riding a chopper. Yeah. Yeah, man. Choppers were a big part of my life for a long time. And uh, but leather will never go away with me. You know, right now I'm yeah. heavily into Japanese jackets because they're nice and slim and they get the best horse hide. And I, I love wearing leather, man. To this fucking day, I wear leather. You know, even when people look but, at it, it's like, oh, man, don't wear leather on stage. You're a comedian. It's like, nah, fuck you, man. You know, uh, listen, 
leather is my first love, man. I'll, I'll always have like a special place in my heart for when I even just smell leather. Like I get, I still get goosebumps. I love leather, you know, and, and certain people like us, we have that attraction and connection to it. And it's just like, it goes, it's, it goes back way deep in our DNA, man. It's like, you know, all the way back in time. Bro, my computer battery is going to kick in like one minute. We're out of here. I just want to congratulate you for uh, starting a new chapter in your life. Uh, do you got a website? The YouTube channel, Rasta okay. Choppers at Rasta YouTube. Rasta Choppers. And, and the Instagram is Rasta Choppers as well. I miss Bro, you. It's so good talking to you, man. I'm so happy to hear how I, I saw your videos. You're hysterical. I was cracking up. It's amazing that you're doing what you're doing, man. And I'm glad that we reconnected. It was, uh, it's been a few years. So now we're together again, bro. Thank you for having me on your show. I appreciate it. I Lots love of you. Love, man. I'll see you when I'm in Miami. Come to Miami. Let's ride some bikes, man. Candles lit, buddy. Cool, bro. Talk to you later. Yeah.